perfect. We're just going to get rolling with the intro. Welcome to another episode of Ring Them Bells. I am very excited to introduce our next guest scholar and co-host of the Divine Council Worldview Podcast, Mike Chu. Mike is a born and bred Bostonian who has been a lifelong resident of Massachusetts. Mike graduated from Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary with a Master's of Divinity and is now a doctorate candidate for the Doctor of Ministry degree in preaching at GCTS as well. Mike is also the academic director at Dr. Michael Heiser's Awakening School of Theology. Mike co-hosts two podcasts, the first, the Divine Council Worldview podcast, and the second is Ask a Scholar podcast. Mike and his wife, Sophia, have been a part of a local multi-ethnic church community in the city of Quincy serving since 2012. If you are a fan of the Divine Council Worldview and the work of Dr. Michael Heiser, buckle up because you are going to love Mike Chu and you are going to love this interview. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show for the first time with me, scholar Mike Chu. Welcome to the show, brother. Thank you. Good to be on here finally. Yeah, glad to have you. And it means a lot for you taking the time to come to be with us today, brother. No problem. Glad to be able to uh, of assistance and yeah. hopefully we can get into some good discussions. Yeah, let's do it. Let's dive right in. Um, so you have a great deal of experience with Dr. Michael Heiser and his work, but before we get there, uh, tell us about your background and upbringing of faith. Give us like a snapshot of your journey before the Divine Council worldview came into play. So, uh, it, you know, I'm basically I'm an American born Chinese Bostonian. Uh, I was born and bred in Bostonian, uh, Boston all my life. I've lived here all my life. I've actually never left Massachusetts really for anything else besides vacations or whatever else. So I've been here for my entire life and I lived in the city of Qu city of Boston, pr particularly for about 28 years. And so like Red Sox nation runs in my blood, you know, like <laughs> yeah. I, I basically became a Christian before the curse of the Bambino was was broken and before Brady was ever the goat. Okay. So there, there's a little bit of that of my kind of Boston pride kicking in. Um, it, when it comes to the spiritual side and really just my faith journey, uh, I didn't grow up in a devout household. Um, it was actually my sister who became a Christian first. She became a follower of Jesus years before I ever did. And unbeknownst to me, she and many of her friends, who would later also become many of my mentors in the youth ministry at our Chinese Heritage Church, um, they had been praying for me. Because I, uh, I wasn't very on fire to actually become a Christian. Uh, Christianity to me was more of a way of uh, I wanted to go to heaven. I didn't want to go to the other place. And so yeah. I had a brilliant plan that I would wait until my deathbed moment, and then I would accept Jesus. And then mm -hmm. voila, I get, I get to go to heaven. Um, a lot of things in life doesn't turn out the way that you ever plan. And so like, that's a life, that's a story for another time, but essentially God revealed himself to me in a very, uh, a very powerful way that I was forced to face one, my own mortality. And it, it was just something that I noticed about my sister and about all these other friends of hers, these counselors, these adults that were in the youth ministry, they lived a life that was very different. And yet at the same time, there was a sense of joy and, and peace that they had. Mm -hmm. And that always kind of drew me towards them. I didn't quite know why. And so yeah, I became a Christian when I was in my teens and I immediately got plugged into a, a small group uh, with a bunch of other teenage guys and one adult counselor from our youth ministry. And he essentially mentored me and those other guys. And it was there that I came to my love of the scriptures. Um, I really attribute him and also my Chinese Heritage Church overall for the the primary metaphorical, metaphorical lens that I carry even still today, we actually were familiar with the idea of spiritual darkness mm. and, and of that there was a spiritual battle. Um, uh, my church in particular was very into the 1040 window missionary movement and trying to, to spread the gospel to particularly nations that were in this 1040, you know, latitude, longitude line in the world. And, 
it was a very common thing to hear of testimonies and of stories and teachings from our pastors and guests that would come that talked about the reality of God and angels and demons. We may not have understood what, you know, what the difference was between a cherubim and a seraphim or that they weren't even really angels. We didn't know any of that, but we knew at least that there was an actual conflict going on in a world that we cannot see. Like I still carry a lot of that core theological training and and really just that development and formation from my uh, from my Chinese heritage church. I look back very fondly on those years and how it really shaped me not just as a Christian, but also as a human being. Yeah, I love that that context that you're bringing because culturally speaking, I was curious to see how the supernatural played inside the, the, your Chinese heritage church, and you answered that beautifully. And one of the things that I love that you said is that you bring this divine encounter with the Word over that it's a place to uh, meet God and be fed. And uh, I actually have on one of my Bibles to remind myself in the front of it. It says, um, "Not an object to be studied, but a place to encounter the living God." And I think that what you said fits that really well, and that's beautiful. So tell us about your discovery moment with Heiser and his work. Um, we all kind of have the aha moment uh, that we've had with uh, the Divine Council worldview. Um, tell us about that moment and then also how that led to a friendship and connection that you have with Mike. Um, the way that I discovered Dr. Heiser's material was Sophia and I were at a Christian leadership conference, and one of the vendors, one of the folks who were there sponsoring the event was Logos Bible Software. And I had heard about them so many times for years, and I had even flirted with the idea of like, oh, would one day I ever go to seminary? And my wife knew this too. And so they were there, and they were selling their software at a, like a 50% off cost, which All was right. just crazy because they don't do that now. No. and. And so I, I go looking at it because I had heard about it and I'm reading through the materials and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And and so I, I go up to my wife with almost like this uh this child childhood glee and just ask, like, would you be like would it be okay if we purchased this? I know it's really expensive, but it's 50% off. <laughs> and she wouldn't tell me until years later, but her initial gut reaction inside was no. It's, it's like too, so expensive, but she, she stopped herself and she realized, wait a minute, if we buy this, maybe this will finally get Mike to start considering seminary. And so <laughs> very cleverly, she said, okay, sure. And so, you know, I purchased one of the packages and as I'm trying to figure out how to use the software and learning it and, and whatnot, on one of the screens in the software, they had this little area where they showed essentially like, oh, this is from Lagos, you know, software and feature products and whatever else. And they had a, essentially a movie trailer built inside the software for this book called Unseen Realm mm. by a scholar I had never heard of, Michael Heiser. And so I, I clicked on it, watched it. And I was very intrigued because I recognized one of the names and the scholars that were featured in the video. And it's like, okay, so he works for this company and he's talking about a spiritual world, a spiritual realm. Interesting. And so I Google a little bit, I kind of get a general feel of what the book is about. And so I go to Amazon and I purchased the, the Unseen Realm and Supernatural because apparently Supernatural was the sort of like the layperson version of that. And so, you know, they come and like, yay, I got these books. And I remember my wife was going to like a baby shower. And so I drove her to the baby shower and I was going to drop by like a Wegmans. And I, I had the supernatural book with me. And I just figured, all right, I'll just, I'll just stick around at Wegmans, get a coffee and just read this while I'm waiting for my wife to be done with the, you know, the friend's baby shower. Mm. And I essentially just like devoured that book. Wow. Like so quickly within about the two hours or so, I think I was already at least halfway, if not like three quarters of the way done with that book. Cause it's a very thin book. Yeah. And you know, just these ideas and especially the explanatory power that in taking in a lot of this deeper ancient Near Eastern context, the second temple period context, like, especially when it got to the part where he mentioned about what was the rock <laughs> that Jesus is talking about in yeah. the gospel of Matthew about on this rock, I will build my church. And 
you know, like I grew up in a evangelical church, very Protestant. And so, it, you know, we, we came to the opinion that the rock was supposed to be the word of God. It's, it's not Peter. He's, he's a pebble. He's not, he's not the rock. <laughs> and, and so we, that was, that's what I thought was supposed to be like good theology. Yeah. And then I'm reading this and all of a sudden there's this dot, this like light bulb on my head. It's like, holy cow. I never even considered the locational context. I never considered the geography because <laughs> yeah. one, I don't like geography. So it would never even have occurred in my mind yeah. that they're literally standing next to a mountain. Yeah. And and, and later on, right, we'll, we'll probably get into it, but like the significance of what that mountain is. But just at the very least, he's actually talking about an actual rock, like a really big rock, a mountain rock. And like that just blew my mind. And so immediately, of course, I finished that book and then I went right into reading Unseen Realm and got into the material. And I, I don't like I, I can't like detail the journey in a very detailed way. It was just more of like, wow, this is this is really amazing. Like I never knew about this. And so I sought more of Mike's material and then I found out he has a podcast, started listening to the podcast, even joined the original Facebook group that was for that podcast. And over time, um, some folks within you know, that Facebook group, they wanted to create a Facebook group that was just focused on talking about the divine council worldview, just specifically about that material, biblical studies. And so I joined with a bunch of other folks as well. And that eventually grew to what is now known as the divine council worldview Facebook group. Mm. And unbeknownst to me, Mike and his wife, Drina had joined the group. They, they saw all this activity and so they joined the group just to see like what's going on like like is this the typical social media craziness and whatever else and they joined and they were pleasantly surprised of like wow you guys actually have good conversations you're doing moderation you're actually trying to to not let like like you know things spiral to a point that people yeah. are just like i hate you and you hate yeah. me and like whatever else like the typical flame wars yeah and so eventually I get a Facebook message of all things from Dr. Heiser. And I'm, I'm, I, I'm almost kind of like beside myself of like, is this real? And it's him asking, hey, I'm, I'm curious, is there a way that we can connect? Can we talk? I'm really interested in what you guys have been doing with this Facebook group. And I kind of want to learn about the story about it. And that was how we first got connected. He I gave him my number, I gave him my email, and then eventually he called me and then we talked about, you know, how did this Facebook group begin? Maybe I need to get in connection with his friend Jorge. And, and just over time, we, we talked over it with the other admins. And we were so honored when Mike decided, I want to make this Facebook group my official Facebook group community. Wow. And, 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 and so that was, that was it. And, and eventually, you know, Mike invited all of us who were involved with his social media presence to come to his home in Jacksonville. What, because by that point, he's already now left Lagos. He was working at the Awakening School of Theology, and he had invited us and a bunch of other folks to come down and just sort of talk and discuss and, and brainstorm on how can we improve his social media presence. And it was there, you know, over time, I got the chance to talk with Mike and share a little bit about our church, my, my faith journey and my church journey in particular. And like, it, it was just really cool to just be able to connect with, with Mike on that personal level. Um, I think one of the things that I've learned very crucially from that conversation with him was the reality that we will never ever feel 100% comfortable whatever setting of church community we may be in. Right, we may never be able to find a church with that. We'll sing all of our favorite songs, or teach our favorite teachings in exactly the way that we would want them to be taught, or or the people that are around us. They're all not like the kind of people I would like to hang out with all the time. Or maybe we don't agree with politics or whatever else. And yet, his ambition has always been, and that what always kept him moving is that whatever community he was in, he wanted to be useful. Yeah. And. That has stuck with me ever since of whatever gifts and talents and and that jived with me because that was eventually why i went into seminary was my journey into seminary wasn't so much of like i felt a calling but i 
I came to a realization of who I am and that if I have these particular gifts, talents, then the most responsible thing that I can do is to become properly trained, mm. right? To, if I have an innate talent or an innate gift from the spirit, but I don't train, I don't learn, I could be harmful to people. And so that was part of my motivation of like, I'm going to go to seminary because I want to be properly trained. And whether that ever, ever ends up me going into more higher education or into the pastorate or whatever, I didn't know. I just wanted to be responsible with my gifting. Yeah. And, and so when Mike said that all he's ever wanted to do was to be useful in the church, that jived. That totally jived. And so that has been helpful for me in, in, in just seeing how God has unfolded and all the things all these, this last year and a half has, has unfolded of just all the stuff. And at the heart of it, I'm trying to just simply be useful. Yeah. Well, I love that. <clears throat> and two words that come to mind for me are sacrificial availability. And Mike <clears throat> had that in spades. The ability to, what he just did with the story with you, I've heard now probably five times from things about Heiser, where he was always open to meet and talk, reaching out to other people, uh, and and even, you know, whatever. People that don't have all their theological ducks in a row. He's, he's always open to meeting and talking and, and discussing. And, uh, you know, I just love that that's carrying over into what you're doing, and that's something that you said. So, so now carry us a little more forward. Tell us about how uh, the moment came. So you guys met. He brought you into Jacksonville. This relationship developed. Um, as time started to, to uh, tick and, and uh, Mike came diagnosed with cancer and a lot of these things came to, to be, uh, tell us about the process and moments of when you started to fill these roles and to step into these moments. Cause it's, it's very apparent. I'm just going to say this for anybody who doesn't know in my audience, Mike Chu is a director of the awakening school of theology for Dr. Michael Heiser. He runs their Facebook page. He's the moderator. He's all over it. He's doing everything to help keep, uh, the teachings and, and the legacy alive for Heiser uh, as much or more than anyone. And, uh, I just want to get some, I'm curious, tell me about that moment when, when, tell me about like when all of a sudden now you're, you're seeing yourself come into these roles. So uh, it's, it's kind of funny. It, it was around the fall of 2022, you know, Mike's cancer has been ongoing for over a year or so more. Um, and I was starting my last year at Gordon with my, my masters of divinity. Uh, I was pretty sure I was going to be done by that spring in 2023. And I remember kind of saying to myself and to my wife that, you know, like, I have no idea what else I was going to do after the MDiv. Um, like, I actually, I actually was seriously thinking, like, you know, I might end up being one of the most overqualified laypersons in the church. <laughs> just, just, just here I am. I have an MDiv degree, but I'm totally fine about going back into like the tech industry or IT, and I just have this biblical training. Yeah. Um, and, and and so I just I didn't know exactly. Um, obviously, my wife would have like I really she wanted me to be able to do something more with it. And so, but that was that was just how it was. And and I think it was it was by the time we got to January, right? And it, it was a little ominous. Uh, I realized later if you if folks ever listen to the first podcast from the Naked Bible podcast where. Um, it's the first of the year in 2023 and you know, his co-host is asking him, Hey, you know, what do you hope for 2023? And, and Mike was simply responding that he really hopes that 2023 will turn out to be a lot better than 2022. Um, and of course I know like generally they record those episodes weeks before. And so he said that before even the beginning of January. Um, but unfortunately, you know, by the beginning of January, it was very clear. Um, his cancer treatments were not doing enough to reduce the size of the tumor. And, you know, unfortunately he had a lot of medical complications that started appearing and, and it became very clear that he might not last more than five or six weeks. And so there was a lot that was going on in the background. I know a lot of folks were trying to prepare for what was the inevitable. Um, and eventually I, I get a, I get a, an email 
from the president of the Awakening School of Theology from Carla. And she introduced herself and she essentially told me that she would like to be able to connect with me if possible. Uh, she had heard a lot about me from Mike and from others that I've worked with at the school because every so often while Mike was going through his treatments, I was asked by him to come on and help with the live QAs for the school. Um, one, to sort of be a conversation partner with him, but two, just in case if because of the treatments, he couldn't show up on one of those live QAs that he trusted that I could take over and wow. just help facilitate that. And so Carla and I talked and that was where she brought up when she asked Mike about who could possibly um, take over his role on the academic directorship stuff. Um, he said that he could come up with a, a list of people and he, he would provide that to Carla. But the first person that came to mind was me. Mm -hmm. it, it, I was generally surprised because uh, by that point, uh, by that point, it, it, I wasn't even done with my MDiv, right? I was, I was heading towards, I was in, literally in my last semester. And, and so that, it really was a shock to me. It, it, I, I had to take a day or so to just take it in. And eventually, you know, I asked my wife, I asked some close friends and the decision seemed very clear to them and also for me and so I, I responded relatively quickly of yes. And I even texted a message to Mike to let him know that I had accepted the, 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 the position um, just so that he would have a sense of, okay, so that, that that's taken care of. That's going to be yeah. moving forward. Um, I never heard back from him directly. I, I mean, it, it I, I didn't expect to. Yeah, it, 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 it was a, it was a hard day on that particular day because she, you know, we had gotten the call that morning that she was, she was on her way out. And, and so we, the whole family and everyone started coming to say their goodbyes. And I, you know, it was like about probably five, six o'clock or so. Finally, everyone in my family, all friends and of hers, they got all gone back home. And Sophia and I were planning on, we're going to stay at the hospice with my sister overnight, just be there with her because the nurse told us that she might be able to, you know, to make it for a couple more days because she still had strong lungs, strong heart, but she was now under, um, you know, the anesthetic because the pain was so great. And so I figured, all right, I'll go back home, pack up some bags so we can stay overnight. And when I'm almost done packing, I get a text message from Drina that Mike passed away in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. It was a very weird moment. And, and then after that text, I then get a text from my wife and then a phone call of like, are you almost done? You need to get back here now. And I get back and, you know, we, we called up two closer friends of my sister to give them the chance to say goodbye to her. And then we said goodbye to my sister as she took her last breaths. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be until like a couple of days later, I realized the strange moment that both Mike and my sister Ruth, they, they, they met each other at the council on the same day. Oh, wow. And, and, and I, I would just kind of like, I, it's my own personal imagination of, you know, maybe it's like, you know, orientation or whatever that, you know, like, welcome, yeah. you know, to your orientation <laughs> training or whatever else. And, and, you know, people are just chit chatting, small talking. And I had this kind of amusing picture in my mind where Mike would ask my sister, wait, so what's, what was your last name? Yeah. Chu. Huh? I knew a Wait a minute, do you know a guy named Mike? <laughs> yeah. It, it just like it just it brought a smile to my face of like as sad and as hard you know, that season was. At the same time, these two people that were very important in my life, they left on the same day and they got to meet each other on the same day, even though they had no idea the influence that each of them had on my life. 
Yeah. You're doing it. What you just did was brave and bold and vulnerable. And those are all things that I really look up to, Mike. And I'm glad that you shared that the way that you did uh, to not only, you know, that's losing one person is incredibly difficult. Uh, but losing two people on the same day is really, really hard. And, you know, I just want to thank you for sharing that moment for me. My curiosity comes out of love, but there's no mistaking that bringing up these things about uh, losing Heiser or even losing your sister, it's not easy. And the way that you just expressed that was beautiful because I think, you know, God honors those connections in ways that we can, can't even imagine. And I think your thoughts are beautiful there. Um, so moving on, as you are the director at the School of Awakening and Theology, and you do have a very robust understanding of the Divine Council worldview, I wanted to see if you could grade my D Divine Council worldview. I wanted to take the opportunity to have you help us understand the DCW and check my work, so to speak. I prepared my best quick exposition of the DCW. I'm going to read it, and I'll have you respond and nuance it for my audience. So the divine council worldview is a biblical perspective that asserts God, our creating father, purposefully operates within and through the construct of a council of created spiritual beings. At various points in the narrative of scripture, members of God's council and other spiritual beings rebel and attempt to lead humanity towards destruction and death. Namely, we have three initial rebellions within Genesis that account for this chaos. The first with the snake in the garden, the second with the unholy union of the sons of God and daughters of men in Genesis 6, and lastly with the Tower of Babel. This divine counsel perspective can also be called the Deuteronomy 32 worldview, because in Deuteronomy 32, Moses brings context to the moment at Babel, conveying that God, our creating father, at this moment, actually assigned the nations to members of his divine council who end up failing and leading the nations into chaos. Okay, pause. That was a lot. But before we go any further, tell me your thoughts on that. And did that sound coherent? <laughs> I think the challenge, right, to teach on a divine council worldview is always that we're grinding against the implicit worldview that we all carry as moderns, right? And that itself is always evolving and that itself is always changing. Uh, you know, a lot of folks don't realize how our modern worldview, a very post-enlightenment, post-modern, uh, post-Christian worldview really does affect the way that we view reality. And everything that you mentioned, I would agree, but that is mainly because I had become familiar with that ancient context and ancient worldview. I think it, it isn't inaccurate. I would say it's it's a very good good summary of what the DCW is or what it incorporates. Um, but you know, it, it is always what I found is it's always difficult when a person doesn't maybe even respect ancient context yeah. to <clears throat> understand this. Um, I mean, is there more that you uh, you you wish to say or you want to continue? No, I think that's perfect. So I have another question for you because I think that's 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 spot on. So what you're saying is that the the summary is correct, but what it needs is the nuance to know of the connection um, to this ancient Near Eastern context, Second Temple literature, all these things that were second nature to the authors and audience of Scripture. Uh, those things need to be brought in to maybe that definition of what the Divine Council worldview is. I love that. Um, so why, why do you think, so for your Chinese Her heritage church, and I love that you told us about that, um, you had a little bit more of a foundation for the supernatural or spiritual focus that the Bible has personally, myself and many others in the Western evangelical world did not get that focus. Uh, Mike famously talks about, you know, maybe 1% in college is, uh, focused on angels. I forget like what percentage he said, but it says like a very small percentage, uh, that he even, you know, got talked to about it. So my question to you is, why do you think this needs rediscovering or uncovering? What in our modern Western churches uh, caused that to, to come out of the light? I mean, I think there is, um, I mean, it, it's a multifaceted issue, right? Because one of, one major problem, especially within the post enlightenment or just in our Western society, especially here in the U.S., Biblical liter literacy 
has been on a steady and really just dramatic decline, especially after the years of the pandemic. Mm. Um, I've been involved with uh, a coalition called the Bible Literacy Coalition. Um, got connected to them because of, of Dr. Carmen Imes and, and got to work with them. And it really was just trying to begin addressing the issue that no one disagrees <laughs> that within the U.S., people have a, a, a very uh, deficient understanding of not just the meta narrative, the grand narrative of, of the Old and New Testament together, but just of any part of the Bible as a whole. Mm. And th that itself is going to be one major reason why it's so hard for people to understand the DCW or this, this worldview, because they're coming at it with a lack of even familiarity with the Bible itself. I think the, the other issue is, you know, we have been entrenched in Western society um, really with a scientific and post-enlightenment with a, a skeptical perspective for generations. You know, it started with modernity and eventually got into postmodernism. And, you know, I do think there is a turn that might be happening. There is some hope on the other end of it all. Well, that there are now new movements such as the neo the neo modern movement, for example, that it's sort of a reaction against the the ills of modernity and post modernity, mm -hmm. and trying to find and blend the two like the good things from the ancient type of thinking with also modern and post modern stuff too, trying to find the good in all of it, and so. I, I think those are some of the challenges, right? We are products of our culture and time. And Mike always liked using the, the metaphor of, you know, just like fish are never really aware of the fact that they're breathing water. <laughs> it just doesn't occur to them that there is anything beyond a world that is just full of water. And for us, it's hard for us to fathom, you know, when, you know, I've said this a few times to friends, that in the ancient context, for the biblical writers, when they wrote the word stars, or they thought about stars, they were not thinking about giant burning balls of hydrogen out in outer space. No. They were thinking of living creatures in the sky, because living things move, and the stars moved. And I would, you know, usually I would get this either quizzical look, or just pure silence, right? Because they just they just don't know. They, they wouldn't know how to respond to that even concept of like, what do you mean? They yeah. didn't know that it was a very big ball of like hydrogen that's burning in outer space. And so I think that's, that's part of why it's important to go into not just context for a divine council worldview, but just overall, if we're going to teach people from the scriptures, the context, the culture, the, the, what shaped the, the ancient writer and the ancient audiences that they were writing to, those are important for us to be able to do proper interpretation. And if, if we don't, those blind spots, and they are truly blind spots, we will naturally and unconsciously fill those gaps of knowledge with our own culture's knowledge and understanding yeah. and just assume Oh, we're square, but it, it, it isn't actually, it, and it's all, it, it takes time to be able to dig down. And, and so this is also what I would probably would say. I, I know when folks get into, you know, Mike's material or learning about the ancient Near Eastern context or the DCW, you know, everyone's really excited and, and they should be. At the same time though, there is also something amazing about the gospel, the good news of, of Jesus the Christ that no matter the, the time or the location, the call to loyalty to the, to, to the one great God and in Christ himself, that is something that a, a child can understand. The child does not need to know, know who were the apocalypse or who were the watchers yeah. or whatever yeah. else, yeah. but that the message of there is a creator God who has made us, who has loved us, and is now calling us to allegiance or loyalty to him, to, to represent him well in this world. And that person that we find our, our identity is in his son, Jesus the Christ. That is a message that any child, any non-Christian, any regular pagan 
can understand. And, and so, you know, we always, I always feel this tension of like, yes, I love this stuff, but it, it is not going to be salvific in of itself. It, we, it needs to always lead back to the center of, of what history is, to the culmination of the God-man that reconciles both the divine and human together. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. And N.T. Wright comes to my mind for two different reasons. Um, one of them is to say that, you know, it, it is like there's this, he gave this one talk where like this guy got up and talked for like six hours and exposited on the prophets, prophets and all this different stuff and leading into the new Testament and just like overwhelmed this crowd. And this little old lady at the end raised her hand and said, you know, how much do I need to understand of that to truly follow Jesus? And, and the speaker looked at her dearly and said, very, very little. And, and, you know, that's, I think that's important to keep in mind, uh, for understanding the salvific, uh, beauty of the gospel and placing our allegiance to King Jesus. But then also it's nuanced with what you said at the beginning and N.T. Wright would echo this, that it does take historical work to truly understand the Bible. And something that you hit on is that, you know, bi biblical literacy is very important that, and that takes work. If we're going to be following Jesus, we need to be biblical literate Christians and we need more of that. And, uh, and, your work at Awakening and uh, the DCW podcast, the Bible Project, all these different uh, avenues that people have today. We, we, we're almost without excuse now because we have a lot of different ways that we can freely tap into this stuff to do the hard work so that we can understand uh, this, this, the beauty of the story beyond that because it is worth it. Uh, you know, when I, when we talk about it as work, it's, it's something that's worth it. So the unseen realm, uh, helped me. I quickly realized the importance of understanding these three divine rebellions in Genesis and also took, you know, the, the importance of the context that second temple literature provides for the authors and audience of scripture. So I prepared three clips from Heiser going over specific talking points over each of these three rebellions. I'd love to watch them with you and then discuss. How's that sound? Sure. Awesome. Let's cut to our Genesis clip going over the first divine rebellion in the Garden of Eden. The fall, of course, we're familiar with. I view this as a divine rebellion story. That doesn't mean that, you know, Adam wasn't there and Adam didn't sin and, you know, Adam's sin really had a, a profound impact on humanity. Of course, all those things are, are kind of no brainers. But you would be amazed at how many evangelical Old Testament scholars do not want to put too much emphasis on the Nakash, the serpent figure in the story and absolutely refuse to look at Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 as having anything to do with that story. Now, there are academic scholarly reasons for that. And I, I will, since I'm being recorded, let me be careful. That's nonsense, okay? <laughs> All right. There are really good academic reasons to not resist those connections. There's a lot that connects the three. But here you have Nakash, you have serpent language, you have Halal ben Shakar, the shining language, brought down, cut down, cast down, the earth, the Eretz, which is another word for the underworld, Sheol, okay, Rephaim, Malachim, okay. All of these terms, again, they, they, they all show up in all three of these passages. And scholars will, will recognize that Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28 are connected. But, you know, all you gotta do is read them. You know, they're, they kind of sound the same. Just one, you know, Isaiah is, is the, the prince of Babylon and Ezekiel is the prince of Tyre and all this kind of stuff. My argument is at the back, at the back of both of these passages, these passages aren't about Eden or about Genesis 3. But that story is in the background to both of them. And the story is a story of divine rebellion. So before I say anything, tell me on your thoughts on that clip emphasizing the divine rebellion that took place in the Garden of Eden. So for folks who may not be familiar, right, the Isaiah passage and the Ezekiel passage, um, for a while, you know, for a long while, you know, until we started getting into like uh, probably the 18th, 19th century, critical scholarship started kicking in. Um, people assumed that those two passages were connected to Genesis three. It was just, it was just like a more traditional church understanding. 
And eventually questions start arising about the identity of the person sp spoken in Ezekiel, especially. Uh, Isaiah, depending on which scholar you're reading, right? The Isaiah figure, some people are okay about connecting it back to Genesis 3. Um, that surely in the end, yes, like there seems to be some thought about this rebellion or some sort of rebellion in this, you know, divine garden in, in Eden. The Ezekiel passage is a little bit more harder to, to nail down, mainly because there's a disagreement from well-meaning scholars on is the divine being or is the being that's described in that Ezekiel passage, is that talking about an angel, like a spiritual being? Or is that talking about Adam? And and honestly, like even though I mostly would side with where Mike had landed on the Ezekiel passage, I do understand the scholarship and why there are those who would say the person in Ezekiel is actually talking about Adam, because it plays into the idea of the priestly king. It plays into the idea of Adam and his wife being priests within the garden. Mm. And and since Ezekiel himself was a former priest, right, that he he's using this imagery and this this languaging as well. And and I don't think anyone would pretty much push against the idea that Adam and his wife were, you know, meant to keep the garden, just like how later on the the Levites and the priests would keep the temple or keep the tabernacle or keep, mm. you know, like there is there is that kind of illusion. So the question is, was Ezekiel thinking about Adam, or was he thinking about another divine being? And, you know, even from one particular scholar that I, that I know of, who's well known amongst evangelical scholarship, he has even slightly modified his view of like, he understands that they might be talking about the, the, the being from, the, from Genesis 3. Um, and, and, and that there's maybe some growing evidence with that, but he's still uncertain, right? And, and, and it's actually from like a well-meaning desire of like, look, this is important. The, the idea that Adam was a priest and a king, like a priestly king who represented not just humanity, not just him and, and his wife, but really like the function of us as human beings, right? And so, so anyways, I feel the tension. Um, I know why Mike said what he said, because he, you know, he, he really came to this conviction of that. And a lot of that is because he sees also those language you know, dots, those strings that are connected, right, to the Nephilim, to the Anakim, to to Eretz, and all these other things that he mentioned, that's how he's factoring in the data, yeah. right? And so you got to remember, right, we're, we're, sometimes we hear of two different scholars, and they have really great evidence. And conclusion, ultimately, will rest on you as the listener. All right, where do I land or can I find some way to mediate that? And personally yeah, for me, I one. actually personally would love it if I could find a way to mediate, <laughs> sort yeah. of like get the best of both worlds. It's not either or, but and both. Yeah, I think that's a, a great way to approach it. But there's also beauty in the way Mike approached it because you know, there were very few fences that Mike Heiser set on. You know, he was he was pretty close to, you know, being on a side, you know, and, and standing his ground and saying and making a stand. You know, sometimes it's um, common for people to to play both sides because it is tough to parse things out, and that's okay too. But then I also appreciate the bravery, um, and and I want to talk about that. It's it's awesome that you brought that up because uh, Dr. John Walton, somebody that I love, who's on this bookshelf right here, um, and our beloved Dr. Michael Heiser had differing viewpoints when it came to understanding what the Bible is referencing as reality and how to parse that out. Uh, Mike obviously believed in the Bible's revelation of a literal divine council that went rogue in real time, uh, while Walton just simply says that the Bible was accommodating the culture of the day and that no reality or truth of the supernatural can be drawn from the texts about the Satan or the Nakash or even the divine council. So leaving their debate aside, um, I was wondering if you could help us parse out how you personally sort what actual reality of evil the Bible calls us to hold when it comes to the Satan, the rogue divine council. How do you parse that out for yourself, Mike? I think like the, the way that I would phrase it is if I had to describe like what is the, what is the benefit of having a, a divine council worldview you know, like mindset, 
what it adds for me and helps me appreciate is that there are actual genuine rivals to the worship of, of God or to the mm -hmm. worship of Yahweh. I think oftentimes the way that we in evangelical, you know, especially in the U.S., we, we sort of, we, we, we just take all these different layers of this tiramisu cake and we just squish it down into one flat chocolate layer mm. and, and just here, everyone just eat this. And that is not very helpful. I think one of the things that really does help, especially once you go into the global and more broader, you know, global evangelicalism, where Christianity is in serious contention with other major religions, especially that you find then in those areas, those evangelicals, those Christians, when they learn about this type of material and that the, the ancient biblical context is actually talking about this polyphora of all these rivals, all these deities, all these Elohim who are trying to vie for the worship and attention of, of human beings, that in their context in the modern day, that jives, that makes sense. That's what they're, they're encountering. The, the temptation to worship a deity, to worship this God, to, to offer sacrifices because maybe this person, this being could help me with having children. Maybe this being could help me get a better job. There is always that temptation. And I think one of the things that the DCW provides is that it, it broadens us out to realize that there actually is serious contention for the worship of Yahweh that when we say, oh, there's a spiritual battle and there's a spiritual warfare going on, I think sometimes we really have this kind of very oversimplified picture of, of just like, you know, like of angels and demons just like spitballing one another and not realizing that there are actually genuine stakes at hand, that the, the enrapturement of people to the worship of other you know, rebellious gods to other rebellious spiritual beings, that that is a genuine issue that has to be resolved. Mm. That the reason why people will worship these other beings is because these beings are providing some sense of benefit and they are tangible benefits. And we in the church have to realize it's not enough to just tell people these, these creatures, they're not real because you will then find the pushback from teachers and adherents of those faiths, oh, I'll show you why it's real. And they'll show you spiritual power. And they'll show you something that would not make sense in a scientific modern way. And so when the church doesn't have an answer or even doesn't want to acknowledge that these rivals exist, then we're not even equipping ourselves to actually contend and to share why our God is such an upside down God. Why he is a God that is always going to never be the way that we assume him to be. And that that is awesome. And that is amazing. But we can't even begin that conversation when we don't even want to acknowledge that there are genuine rivals to the worship and the affection of human beings for the creator God. Um, yeah, you know, for me personally, I, and I think you, you, you would, you would agree with this personally, I stick with Jesus, uh, as my determining factor for understanding the reality of Satan or other supernatural evil. Uh, Robert Alter has a quote, um, where he famously says the Bible is historicized prose fiction. Um, and what that teaches is that the scriptures utilize literary devices the authors of the Hebrew scriptures use these devices to convey ultimate truth about reality. Uh, but then the big question for us comes as moderns is how do we parse out faithfully in our own lives as what actual reality scripture is calling me to hold? And for me, it jumps off of the page on with Jesus. You know, it's like I really I just got through listening to the podcast where Mike um kind of uh, uh, reviewed um, John Walton's uh, Demons book and, you know, because th there was a lot of this in there. And these, these these are big questions for me that I still wrestle with, like, on the daily as I'm, I'm encountering scripture and, and, and going through. But for me, Jesus is the one that helps me parse it out because, you know, and, and Mike, with what you said with The Rock, with that quote, with all the other things that, he, that when you understand the divine counsel worldview, like, all these things start to click 
to see how it connects with Jesus and parses out for me into the actual reality of the struggle that we have against these evil powers that Paul spoke you know, out uh, about as well. And I'm glad that we have you in the position that we have because, you know, with your background, like just how freely you spoke about that, you know, I know pastors that would just laugh at that right now. You know what I mean? That like, oh, that's silly. Oh, you know, like that's just the ancient Hebrew thought. You know, that's not the way we live and think today. And, 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 and it's, it's, I'm glad that we have that balance there with you. So next, I want to cut um, to our second clip in Second Rebellion, um, going over Genesis 6 and its context and connection to the Apkalu. First, let me give my audience some background. An ancient Mesopotamian myth, that is the Israelites' ancient Near Eastern neighbors, it was believed that the gods created humankind to cultivate the soil to make sure that uh, the gods, by means of sacrifice, would receive their meals. And this is Mesopotamian ancient Near Eastern mythology. However, the first people in these stories, they didn't understand how to perform these tasks. They were supposed to, and they needed divine knowledge. So these Mesopotamian gods sent what we call the Apkalu, who are these seven sages and teachers, and viewed as a positive resource in this narrative. As we will see, not so in the Hebrew narrative. Um, in the context of Second Temple literature, these lesser gods who give supposed divine knowledge to humans are specifically called watchers. That distinction is important. Let's cut to this awesome clip about Heiser talking about the statues in Apkalu. Archaeologists have actually uncovered figures of Apkalu. There's actually a whole book where you can get illustrations of Apkalu. You know? And Apkalu, again, realized before the flood, you know, they're, it's, they're neutral. Before the flood, they're completely divine. They could be good or evil, whatever. After the flood, then that's when they get punished. You know, that's when Marduk doesn't like them and all that. But they used to be buried underneath buildings, underneath foundations of buildings to avert evil from the house or whatever the building was. Well, they're given a name. The figurines are called Matsare, which literally means in Akkadian, watchers. Oh, well, that doesn't mean watchers like over here. It just, <laughs> that's just a coincidence. <laughs> No, I mean, you know, Honest goes in, and he's not the only one. There's a guy named Stuckenbrook who writes a lot about the, the term Jireen watchers. Um, you know, that's what they called them. And so whoever's writing Enoch, again, to make sure that we don't miss the fact that I'm, I'm writing this about those Apkalu guys, okay, he actually takes the term watchers and puts it into Aramaic. So that you get it. You can't miss it now. Hello, oh, it's right it's right over here. When you read this, I want you to be thinking of that. And they were. They were. We aren't. Because we either, again, don't, don't, you know, we know about the Old Testament and the New Testament. We don't know about this Mesopotamian stuff and all oh, that awful second temple stuff, that Enoch stuff. That's just all heretical. Don't read that. Okay, you know, we, so we know two of the four points. We don't connect them. And then on top of that, we strip the supernatural out of it and we go, now we understand the passage. Really? <laughs> really? Can you explain that to me again? Uh, again, they, they would not have made these mistakes, but we do. So, Mike, one of the most fascinating discoveries for me is how the Bible is in constant conversation with the culture of its day. Nowhere is this more evident than with that connection of the Apkalu highlighted by Mike in this clip. How does Enoch and other Second Temple literature help us see the word of caution that the Bible was speaking out against, against the divine tampering stories like the Apkalu, Anunnaki, uh, that we have from Israel's ancient Near Eastern neighbors? So I, I think this, you know, this goes back to um, to what you were noting in your observation about, you know, Walton's Demons book and, and the book that Mike had reviewed prior to his passing. Um, I didn't know exactly until a few months ago that there were actually two kind of different perspectives or terms to describe within ancient Near Eastern studies and especially within biblical studies. Uh, typically, what Walton is doing is usually termed as comparative religion. Right. It, it, it's looking at the different cultures and times of like the, the Akkadians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, and then sort of like, okay, what did they believe? What, what language, what words are they using? Oh, that's interesting. Maybe some of that's connected to the Hebrew scriptures, right? And, and so there's like a comparison versus 
what Mike is doing and probably a few other folks who are within it, like that kind of stream of thought, what he had done was seeing the Genesis account as not a comparative, but as a polemic, right? A, a polemic is a written up piece where you're taking material from another culture or another you know, work, and you're now using it in a way that actually is a diatribe, is actually you know, criticizing <laughs> those who thought our story is really great. It's like, really, is it now? Let me show you. And, and, and so essentially what Genesis 6 and the, the, the connection about the watchers or you know, the sons of God, because that's how Genesis 6 describes it. The sons of God sees the sons of, you know, the, the sons of Seth or the sons of, of, I think it was Seth. And they, they connect, they, they take them as wives, which like, no, that's, that's, that's a pretty bad idea. Um, that from that culture in Acadia, right? The, the watchers or the sages, the ap Apakalu, they were seen as actually good, right? Cause they would have taught their culture how to, you know, how to manipulate metal, how to manipulate cosmetics, how to take care of farming and whatever else, and how to create weaponry to defend yourselves and whatever else. And what Genesis 6 is actually doing is taking that kind of story or that like kind of th thematic idea and spinning it on its head and saying, so what if they're not actually heroes? What if they're actually villains? And instead of actually helping us, they were actually trying to, to feed into our own self-destruction. And, and so, so there's that, that that's, yeah. that's kind of what's happening. Um, for folks who, who may not be, you know, I, I, cause I noticed that you, you mentioned the Apokalu yeah. and in the ancient Akkadian material, the Apokalu are basically these sages. They're divine beings, they're spiritual beings who are sages they they are full of wisdom and knowledge and they impart that to human beings and thus why the acadian society came to be that's like part of their whole like this is how we existed this is why we came to be was because these great guys the apocalypse helped us and you know <laughs> genesis 6 you know the the, the 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 story essentially is like uh no absolutely not and then eventually the first enoch writers they're taking those those cues as well and making sure we're going to use the word watchers and make those connections and those illusions back to the apocalypse. It's like, no, again, they're not heroes, they're villains yeah. and, and, and just spin it on the head. But there is the other word that you use, the, the Anakin. And I would recommend if folks are looking for a little bit more description or detail from a reference guide about what that is, I would recommend this book. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, a handbook of the gods and goddesses of the ancient Near East. I was, I remember when I got this, the, it came in the mail finally. I was like so excited to start reading it. And I remember texting Mike of like, this is so amazing. I wonder, is like this like another version of like, you know, the dictionary of, of deities and, and demons. And, and of course, Mike responds back. It's like, oh yeah, I have that book. It's a good read. <laughs> and I thought it was like a new book. And he is like, oh no, yeah, I've had it. It's, it's pretty great. <laughs> it's like, of course you do. <laughs> of course you do. Not gonna one up him on that, right? <laughs> Never. No, but I was, I was just so excited, and I was like, oh, I had no clue. <laughs> yeah. Well, it doesn't take much work when you trace through ancient Near Eastern history, or you could even go global and come over to the Mayans and Aztecs. There's common threads that are remarkable uh, in all of their storylines uh, that. Are very, it's very apparent to me in the Hebrew scriptures, like you said, that has a polemic that, that really speaks against all of them since all of these other ones have this kind of common thread of something coming from beyond, some type of supernatural divine uh, wisdom coming through that you know is supposed to advance man and, 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 and all that. And I can't bring up the Apkalu or the Anunnaki without referencing Joe Rogan. Um, as I've said before on the show, we don't advocate that Joe Rogan is like an ultimate source of truth, um, but that Joe Rogan is one of the great free American thinkers of our day. And it's also been obvious to me, Mike, and a lot of other people that the gospel is breaking through in the show and the mind of Joe Rogan. Um, to that point, I've developed a segment here that I wanted to share with you first, um, and it's called Reforming Rogan. And basically, as I get scholars on like you, I want to just take small clips of when I see uh, Rogan uh, misunderstanding or uh, trying to, to 
parse out this stuff that we're talking about and us just discuss it um, and, you know, kind of help uh, bring some some light and positivity to, to help share this this uh, these message with people that follow Rogan and for him. So before we get to our last Heiser clip, I want to watch this clip with you from a recent Joe Rogan interview and then discuss. Does that sound cool? Sure. Hey, Jamie, pull up that clip. I've been talking to a lot of people over the last few months, which is not maybe not a good sign for the direction my life's going. <laughs> but I've been talking to a lot of people over the last few months that think that aliens are angels, angels and devils. And that's like what when you're hearing about like all those stories in the Bible about fallen angels and devils, like th these people think that they were referring to aliens. That, that fell from the sky? No, the, it's just the term, the, the, the way they're phrasing it is like fallen angel, meaning like Satan, and that there's good angels and bad angels, there's demons and angels. What, what these people believe, and I don't necessarily agree with it, nor do I even understand it enough that I can argue against it, but they believe that all these stories are really referencing a spiritual force that's always here all the time and sometimes exists in the physical form. And it might be existing as these things that we keep looking for, like aliens and UFOs. And it might be doing that maybe even to comfort us or maybe to be more plausible or maybe to hide the true nature of what they are. So it will present as if it's from another planet. But really what it is is some sort of interdimensional spiritual being that may or may not be evil. It might be good, it might be evil, and there might be a bunch of different kinds out there in the world. But that these stories from like the ancient Hindu texts, and you know, Billy Carson talks a lot about that, and um, a, a bunch of other people talk about these different stories from these ancient texts that, show, that have people either interacting with sky people or someone coming from the sky and interacting with them. And they think that these, a lot of these things might be talking about the same thing and that these aliens that people are encountering, what there's some sort of an interdimensional being that has essentially always been here. So before I say anything to you, I want to ask you about that clip and just the first part where Rogan mentions that like a lot of these people are talking into him. And then if you listen through to what he said and try to parse out that this guy does not know the divine council worldview, like you said, all the background and stuff that we have, it feels like to me somebody's talking to him about the divine council worldview. I could be wrong. But before I say anything, tell me, uh, like, what's your first response after watching that clip? I mean, I think it was, I mean, it, it is interesting to see, I, I think it was Paul who talked about how, you know, humanity, that we as humans, we are we are grappling through the darkness, trying to, to, to comprehend and to actually connect with God. Mm. And so I, I see something of that going on within Joe Rogan. It, it's, it's actually kind of was encouraging. It's, it's, it's interesting is that, you know, what's happening, right? Is that he's taking and then whoever's talking into his life or sharing this kind of stuff with him and think it's really cool. And just like, you know, shooting the breeze that th they're trying to take modern understandings right of science or of ufos of thinking like oh there are multiple dimensions maybe there's multiple universes or whatever else and <laughs> and they're using those those terms those concepts the the science of physics and whatever else and and they're using terms to try to describe transcendence mm. they're trying to use words in a modern scientific way to describe spiritual stuff yeah. Or, or or things that we that would see from ancient peoples, they would use stories, they would use religious language, which ironically is simply their religious language because they, they that's what eventually got termed as. But that was the world, the way that they saw how their world worked, right? They that's how they saw the world be, and so they're using the language of their day mm -hmm. to describe what they are sensing is actually real, and. All I'm seeing with Joe Rogan is he's using the same methodology. It's just that the languaging and the knowledge is maybe upgraded in the opinion of some people. Like, oh, he's using higher scientific knowledge. But it, at the end, it's at the end of the day, it is still of a human being trying to grapple and trying to touch transcendence. Yeah. It's trying to touch the eternal.
Yeah. And maybe even the other way around of, uh, you know, both yeah. sides of it. Because, you know, the beauty of the story of the gospel is not that just these other rogue spiritual beings are down here trying to infiltrate and do this tampering with man to bring death and chaos, but that we also have the one true God uh, that's entered into the story that has uh is on a rescue mission for us that is redeeming us that 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 is also searching out um and and trying to give true knowledge that comes from uh following Jesus that we know and I see that happening kind of with Rogan and I'm I'm glad you picked up on it too cuz it's beautiful because just as spiritual evil used the guise of the Apkalu or the Anunnaki or the watchers of Enoch to come and manipulate and spread harmful information to bring humans into chaos um, it, it, I see that same type of correlation with what Rogan's, you know, what, what he's talking about. And, and, and I still believe exist even to this day, you know, that, that with the talk that we have with aliens, um, our government, you know, we've had Matthew Halstead on here multiple times talking about a lot of the, uh, incredible claims that our government is making. And I see correlations, uh, that, that, that let me believe uh, that you know Paul was right to tell us that it's never another human that we wrestle against, and that you know taking up the armor of God is about you know um, is about that sp that spiritual battle that we're in, and then also you know Dr. Heiser even bringing it over to baptism helped me understand how that is a declaration of uh, uh, spiritual warfare. So, do you see any correlation in in all of that, or w what are your thoughts? I mean, I I think. You know, in the end, right, like when that clip of Rogan, it's encouraging it really is because he's trying to grapple with, you know, one, it shows that our modern and post-Christian and, you know, really just almost some sense post-scientific worldview these days, people have found lacking, mm. right? And, and I, you know, so a fun fact about me, most people don't know, I am a Star Trekker. Like I, I'm nice. a big fan of Star Trek. And uh, OK, I'll be honest, I haven't watched Discovery, that kind of stuff, <laughs> a little bit more like uh, original TNG and DS9. Uh, okay. I sort of like Voyager a little bit on the side. But um, anyways, but the what, funny thing about even those series, right, and Gene Roddenberry's vision of the future was that humanity originally would be just like, you know, hit this utopian state. We finally just get our act together. We we won't have money. We, we would pursue art and, and scientific research just for the fun of it and, and, and whatnot and what and whatnot. And yet, interestingly enough, in the show, even the characters are still longing for, well, we still die we still don't know what happens after we die. Yeah. And, and, and like, we can prolong life now, maybe, you know, like at the, in their world, in that storyline, like humanity, human beings can live up to like 120, 130 at best. And then eventually, you know, like, you know, the, the, the heart can only go on for so, so long. long. Yeah. And, and, and eventually they all die. And, and they still grapple with, those fundamental core human questions that we have always been asking. Yeah. And even in like the show, like Picard, they, they dealt with like, well, what happens when Picard dies? And what did they do? They implant his consciousness into a, a robotic body so that he as a person can continue on to have some sense of like the eternal life. Yeah. Like it, it, it's, it's again, using science and whatever else to try to grapple with like these core questions at the end of the day, that still haunt us yeah. <laughs> that we cannot answer. And you know, so I don't, I don't think we should ever begrudge folks like Joe Rogan or whoever else who are trying to use the today's terminology and knowledge. And they're trying to grapple with the transcendence. Yeah. And it, what really is like, this is a bridge in some sense, it's a bridge being built from our side. And what maybe folks like me or others will need to do is help make that bridge and extend it back to the ancient context of like, hey, you know, your questions and the thoughts you're having, these people did too. And look, it's actually, in the end, it leads back to the one creator God called Yahweh. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, like to me, I, I see it as an opportunity, not as a deterrent. Um, is there some weird stuff? Sure. But at the same time, when people are just trying to grapple and trying to figure things out, this is what you two expect.
yeah. just as much as like what was going on in the ancient Near Eastern context. They're all trying to figure out what do these gods want? Yeah. And I, I remember that th this book from Daniel Block, this 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 oh, was wow. an amazing book and i would recommend anyone to 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 yeah. have checked it out the gods of the nations check this out because daniel block also was uh, dr carmen imes's uh mentoring professor right he was the one to help direct her phd dissertation that type of stuff so good thoughts from this guy and one of the things that he pointed out that in the ancient Near eastern context the majority idea was the gods are directly connected to the land that's their primary relationship. That's the thing they care about the most. And whoever happens to be living on the land, well, sucks to be you because now you're beholden to that God. You're beholden to that goddess. You, you, you have to give tribute. You have to worship. You have to, because to, you are basically owned by this God because you are on this God's land. And what do we see with the people of Israel? God is moving with his people wherever they are. He's not connected primarily to the land. He's connected primarily to the people. Wow. And that is such a different contrast. Yeah. Right. It's when people learn about the ancient Near Eastern context, they sometimes get disturbed because oh, all these similarities, the, the, these similarities, they bother me. Does this mean the Bible's not true? And really, the question should be asked: Yes, there are similarities because they're you. They're drawing from the same like thought world. The question is, what's different? Yeah. That's actually where you notice the highlights. That's what makes it so significant. It's the differences, not the similarities. The similarities are to be expected. Yes, there's flood stories. Woohoo. What's the difference between Noah's flood story with the other flood stories like the, like the, the tale of the Epic of Gilgamesh? Yeah. Right? Those are the questions that need to be asked. What are the differences, not the similarities? Because if they're coming from the same culture, world, if everyone believes like stars are living creatures, then they're all going to come with that kind of basic understanding. And then the Israelite is coming at it with, but, and then they go on into yeah. the creator. God is not Baal. It's Yahweh. The, the, the angels, some are good. Some are really bad. Yeah, and, and so on and so forth. That, that there are these differences, and you know, I see folks like Joe Rogan. To me, that's hopeful. Right? It, 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 you know, they're they're starting from the the our side of the bridge, and they're trying to like, how do how do I reach the other end? How do I get to the ancient context? How do I connect this? Like, I don't get it. I don't know how to. And so, for those of us who are trained on the other side, maybe there's a way to meet. <laughs> there's yeah, a way yeah. to help bridge and i think heiser was was so uh groundbreaking with that to be able to cross worlds uh bridge gaps where it needed to be and uh you know you what you just brought up with the the um uh divine council or the uh, rogue uh, leaders of the nation spiritual beings the, having that connection with the land is super important for us as we move on to this last clip uh, with Heiser going over the divorce of the nations at Babel and what I call family planning um, that God brought forth with Abraham. So let's cut over to this last clip. What God does is he divorces them. And then he says, okay, I'm going to show you how it was supposed to be done. I've divorced all of you, so now I need a new people. Okay, I'm going to go over to this guy, Abraham, in Ur, and I'm going to call him. And he's too old to have kids, and his wife's too old to have kids, but now watch. Okay, I'm going to raise up for myself my own inheritance. Jacob is my allotted heritage. Israel is my portion on the planet. I've consigned the rest of you under the authority of other lesser Elohim. Hopefully they will rule according to my justice. They'll be like me. Hopefully... You will be able to look at my people now, Israel, as what life would be like if you were living in relationship to me. And if, if my people follow the law, they'll be happy. They'll have good lives. I will bring them to a land. They'll enjoy life. That land is now sort of a mini Eden or a new Eden. At least it's supposed to be because I'm there. I'm there. Heaven is going to meet earth again. I will occupy that space. That will be sacred space. They will be a kingdom of priests between me and you. 
And they're supposed to attract you back to wanting a relationship with me, not one of these other guys. And the Psalm 82, the gods become corrupt. They get they seduce the Israelites into worshiping them. The whole thing, you know, just sort of blows up. Because humans are wicked. Because they are corrupted again by other forces, you know, outside of their own nature. And they got a lot of people we have a lot working against us, okay? We sure do. We sure do. All right, so Mike, before I say anything, tell me your thoughts on that clip from Mike Heiser talking about Babel. Well, I think some people don't realize that there is a connection between you know Genesis 11 and Deuteronomy 32, or actually even I would even put, dial back a little bit further to even Deuteronomy chapter 4, right? Where Deuteronomy 32 is the poetic uh, rendition and description of, of Deuteronomy 4, where it talks about you know don't worship the sun, moon, stars, don't don't worship these other gods and everything that the other peoples you know, that they have been consigned to, to, to these, to these folks. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize the, the actual practical implications of Genesis 11 throughout the, the biblical meta narrative, where you have these 70 nations that are mentioned and think of it from an ancient Israelite perspective, right? They're trying to explain how in the world did the world become the way that the world is? Why are we like, why are there so many people groups? Why are there so many people groups who worship so many different gods and goddesses? And so what Genesis 11 is pointing out to is the, the very starting point, the, the seed that begins to grow into what eventually the Israelites in their later time, they would see as there are all these different nations and all these different gods that these nations worship. And like, how, how, how did that happen? Mm. And so that is a little bit of what Genesis 11 is pointing out. And, you know, it goes right into the Deuteronomy 32 verse eight, you know, context of the sons of God, not the sons of Israel, but the sons of God were allotted to take care of these different people groups. Yeah, the way that Mike described it, I, I like it. I think the way that he uses the word divorce, like maybe. I think the, uh, another way of saying it is that these divine beings were designated to govern, to take care of, you know, these different people groups. Yeah. While Yahweh was going to focus on Abraham and his wife Sarah. And, and, yep. and I need to spend time with them. And in many ways, it's a very subtle thing that's, that Mike is kind of alluding to is the importance of one choosing, laying down one's loyalty to Yahweh willingly, mm -hmm. right? Like, like he wants to show this is what it means to be part of my family. And is it not really good? So good, in fact, that the other nations would be, I like that. Yeah, you know, I, I actually, I, I think, that's actually a lot better than the deal that we have. How, how do we get into this? <laughs> like, how, yeah. how do we yeah. get, how do, yeah. how, like, what's going on here? It, it, like, that was the point, right? And um, on the that's Ask a Scholar I, podcast, uh, you know, me and Carla, we had a, a Levitical scholar, uh, Jay Scalar, Bar, on. Yeah. And one of the things that we talked about was like, yes, we as moderns, especially as Gentile moderns, right? We are reading Leviticus and we're just thinking like, my gosh, like I can't eat pork. I have to do this. I can't touch seafood. Like, like we're, we're like so thinking about all these weird things, but what's really going on is that we're not realizing we are one culture looking at another culture. And there is a little bit of translation. There's a little bit of culture shock that's happening. But ultimately, like that same kind of thing is happening with their neighbors. Yeah. Right. You will have people who are not Israelite, but they'll come into the land of Israel because they got some goods to sell. I got some great cedar that I wanted to sell you and, and whatnot. And they'll eat it, eat a meal. Like, hey, do you have a, do you have a pork belly dish? No, nope, we don't serve pork, but we do have some great beef ribs. Right. And, 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 and so they'll they'll start talking and conversing like, why don't you guys have pork? Like pigs are awesome. It's like, no, well, it's because our God doesn't want us to be eating those those animals because they're not kosher what the heck is kosher right like and you, you get into conversation and dialogue and that's in some sense a very natural and all relational way of connecting with people yeah and and so it, it's a brilliant plan because would it not be awesome if people volitionally on their own decide to worship the same god 
right? Like I will actually choose. Like I actually want to, not because I'm being forced to, but because I want to worship this God. Yeah. Uh, not because I'm obligated because it's family tradition or it's just this is what we have always done, but because I get to choose. I will actually want to worship this life-giving, life source of a God who is way better than the ones that, that my family had worshipped. Like, it's a brilliant plan because what you get all wrapped up into that package is love, devotion, affection, loyalty. You, you get volition. You get, I have decided and I am not going to turn back kind of thing. Yeah. No, and I, I think you hit the nail on the head when you said that to kind of nuance what Mike was talking about with divorce. That's why I use the word family planning, that like at Babel, it wasn't disinheriting. It was planning to bring back in. Like the, the, the whole goal of Yahweh identifying himself with Abraham and this specific people group was so that it would flow out into the nations and call them into the worship of the one true God. And, you know, then, like Mike said, we have the odds stacked against us because these uh, uh, um, divine counsel that were ruling the nations were supposed to govern and, and bring them up the right way, and they rebelled. And we have them trying to seduce the Israelites to worship them and everyone else. Um, so it's, it's a love story, and it's family planning, and, and I think that's great. So as, as we're closing here, Mike, I want and, and to that point in sharing all this, I want to take a second um, and see if you could share with my audience the direction and path of the Divine, Divine Council Worldview community. We just had a bunch of announcements a few days ago. Um, I want you to help us, help my audience understand how we can get plugged in uh, with what the, the work that's happening in Awakening and with the, the uh, DRMSH and, and the uh, Michael Heiser Foundation, Miklat, all of it. Help us understand where it's going and how we can help. So let me start with the with the Michael S. Heiser Foundation. It used to be known as McClot. Um, the the name has been changed to to honor Mike. Um, the the foundation, the nonprofit, has been taken over by his his widow Drina, mm. and so the foundation is still actually moving forward. And one of the reasons why this nonprofit was created by Mike in the first place was he wanted to have a, a nonprofit that would help fund in the creation of translations of his content, of his material, right? So books such as Supernatural or the other books like Demons or What Does God Want? Those books he's been wanting to translate into different languages and provide that for free to publishers in different countries that would want to publish his materials, mm. right? And so that's part of the work of what, the core work of what McClatt had always been about was trying to provide translation work. and. Eventually, as you know, after Mike had passed away, one of the things about our mission within the Michael S. Heiser Foundation has been to also, you know, encourage and really help make the Divine Council worldview theology, the, the framework, the, the, the background material more, not just only in the, you know, in the know for those who are in scholarship, but more into the mainstream evangelical, you know, dialogue and discussion. And so that's one of the reasons I'm one of the co-hosts of the Divine Council Worldview podcast with Dr. Ron Johnson. That's a project that's under the Michael S. Heiser Foundation. And there's many other legacy projects that are going on, such as a systematic theology book that Ron is finishing up for Dr. Heiser. Um, it was a book that Mike had wanted to do for a long time, which is trying to sort of weave together, well, what are the practical implications? How would that look like if we incorporated a DCW perspective into a systematic theology type system, hmm. right? And, you know, people usually assume that Mike wasn't, wasn't thrilled about systematic the theologians, but the reality was he actually saw them as a different toolkit, right? That, wow. that the, the tip, the typical relationship between biblical scholars slash biblical theologians like Mike and systematic theologians it's like, you know, people think of that as like, oh, they're butting heads. But the ideal relationship is that biblical theologians, biblical scholars are doing the, they're doing the groundwork. They're digging down into the text. They're doing the grammatical historical work. They're providing the data. And that data needs to then be provided to the systematic theologian who can then understand like, all right, my specialty is how to make it into a cohesive, understandable idea. 
and systemize that. How like explain it in a way that's comprehensible to people. And the reality is we're supposed to be partners, not adversaries. Mm. And so that's kind of the thing of where Mike wanted to at least show like, all right, this is how a, 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 a systematic theology, if it incorporated and took into account a divine counsel worldview, this is what I hope it would look like, or I think it could play out this way or how it can contribute to that conversation. And so, you know, thankfully, Dr. Johnston is helping finish up that book because I never got to finish it. Yeah. It was, it was one of his, his passion projects towards the end. Uh, I, I had, a, I had a little bit of a hand in helping him with it because he wanted to, to dig into what do other systematic theologies like go into, what verses do they use? What kind of research do they draw from? And so one of my jobs uh, that he asked me to do was to essentially read through a couple of full on systematic theo theology books and then just write up and, and do a whole entire work of like, here are all the verses that they use to talk about this topic, this topic, this topic, this topic. Um, it's partly also why I, I, like, I got to read all of Dr. Michael Burtz's evangelical theology book was because of that work. And nice. holy cow, if people haven't picked that book up, like, please pick that book up. It is so good. I, I understand now why Mike is like, it, that's why he featured Dr. Bird on the podcast, because he was asked the question, like, well, what book would you recommend? What systematic theology book would you recommend? And it was Bird's book in the end, mm. because it may not, he may not agree with everything, but at the same time, Bird does do a pretty darn good job of incorporating ancient Near Eastern context, Second Temple material. Like he actually is also doing the groundwork, the grunt work of that. And so it's a really cool picture. But anyhow, um, that's a little bit of what we're doing over at the Michael S. Heiser Foundation. It's just all of these legacy projects. And, you know, like we recently announced that the Facade series is continuing. Uh, and the dirt book is going to be called The Cipher. I think I think that's the name I'm trying to remember because it was a late night live stream yeah. <laughs> and you know Drina and the board we were able to obtain essentially you know a, a writer who would help take the notes that Mike had for the dirt book and finish out the trilogy and so that's exciting it's about a two-year project so you know it's getting underway he's going to be doing a lot of the research and digging into and and trying to write in some sense like write as though he you know, to honor Heiser as best as he could. And so, so yeah, so that's a little bit of the news from the foundation uh, for Awakening School Theology as the academic director. Um, what I will share is that starting on September 3rd, so currently the way that the school started, we started with like a pay for course model, right? People create an account, they log onto the website and they pay for courses that they would want to take. And when we started, it had to be that way because there's a lot of initial costs to starting up a theology school. Yeah. There, there's no way around that. And so it was decided by the Awakening Board that we're coming to a point where we want to really just trust and depend on what God is doing within the organization. And we're moving to a completely donation funded model mm. where all the courses will be made free for everyone and anyone to take starting on September 3rd. You don't, you will not have to pay for any courses. You can sign, create up an account, click on, I want to take this course. I want to take that course. I want to do this course and you will have access to it indefinitely. That's the heart of what we are wanting to do. However, for us to continue as an organization and to continue making new courses, we are moving to a donation model where we are asking, and this is only 20% of the entire student body, right? Of all the folks who have ever taken courses at our school who are currently taking courses, it's only 20% number. And that would be 700 people to provide on a regular monthly basis, $40 a month, 700 people. That's the minimum that we need. That's at bare minimum what we need in order to pay for logistics, overhead costs, and the creation of all the free Bible reading content that we're doing with our Bible reading community, with the Ask a Scholar podcast that we're producing, and also factored into all that cost is creation of four courses per year. So a course per quarter. If we go above that number, that'll be great because that means we can create more courses. 
I have a lot of ideas for courses and, and scholars I want to bring into the school. But you know, if we're if we can only hit our our bare minimum number, we will only be able to do four per year. But that's assuming we get the 700 people who will contribute on a monthly basis as a vision partner, $40 a month. I love that. And for people that look and check the notes, I'm going to have the link uh, for Awakenings website where you can become uh, a vision partner and donate. They've got a lot of great material featuring uh, Matthew Halstead, uh, lots of different great scholars that you can go through, uh, teachings from Dr. Heiser, um, that they're making available. And I love this model, Mike, when you guys did that and make this announcement, I really saluted how brave you guys were being. This is the way I think of following what you guys did perfectly building the, the, the system up, but then offering it now as value. If we've created value like you guys have with this awesome product, people are going to want it to stick around and want to be a part of it. And I, I think that's going to happen. I'm going to continue to pray for it. We're going to offer some support here from the channel. And that leads perfectly into what I wanted to announce and talk about with next. Um, we have a huge announcement about the Heiser documentary that this channel's co-producing with Ruben Evans of Visual First Films. Um, I've prepared a special sneak peek clip um, for you and my audience. So let's check this out because it pairs perfectly with what we just talked about. Okay, so we are rolling. Okay, uh, name and title for our editor. My name is Michael. I'm, I'm looking right at you, right? right yeah, at me, okay. Yeah. My name is Michael Heiser. Mike Heiser is good enough. I am the executive director for the Awakening School of Theology and Ministry in Jacksonville, Florida. How's that? That's good. <clears throat> right. The title has not changed since we did the Demons video <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> These might be emails going different directions, different <laughs> times. Wherever the spirit leads. I should give him some sort of Hindu yogi title or something. <laughs> that will only help your reputation. Right, right. <laughs> All right, let's, let's get right into it. Why should Christians care about angels? The work and teachings of Dr. Michael Heiser impacted so many of us and changed the way that we read our Bibles forever. Heiser continually wrote and spoke about tough topics and dedicated his life to helping us all rediscover our Bibles on their own terms. Mike truly is a hero of our faith. We at Ring Them Bells are privileged and beyond excited to be partnering with Visual First Films and Ruben Evans to be producing a top-rate documentary going over the life and teachings of Dr. Michael Heiser. Heiser was a revolutionary scholar for not only his findings and research, but also for his dedication and constant availability, and in my opinion, helping create some of the best Christian content ever made. Mike was tenacious and bold, constantly creating content up until the very last moments of his life. It is this content that will shape the direction and scope of this documentary to honor Mike and his legacy. The last content Mike produced was a letter that he sent out days before he passed to his fans, friends, family, and colleagues. It was this letter that galvanized the mission here at Ring Them Bells and continually echoes in my mind as I take steps forward following God through this ministry. Awesome organizations like Miklat, the Michael Heiser Foundation, Awakening, and the Divine Council Worldview podcast continue to keep us connected with the Divine Council Worldview and the work of Michael Heiser. As we start to gain momentum in the production of this documentary, I wanted to share this letter he left with you in efforts to draw support both for the documentary and also for all of the channels that continue to share Mike's teaching and legacy. We need your support. An excerpt from the last words and letter of Dr. Michael Heiser. Let's turn to the future. As all of you know, when I pass, I will join the family of God and his counsel, to which all of us as believers presently belong, but not yet in its fullness. This is what awaits me, and I am glad. We will see each other in the future in unimaginably glorious ways. Until then, I have great hope and earnest expectation that all of you will contribute or continue to contribute to my ministry. Thousands of you have expressed how my work and content has changed your lives. I believe you, as my experience described briefly in the unseen realm was equally life-altering in my own case. My view of scripture and purpose in ministry and life was never the same after encountering and processing the divine counsel worldview. 
thousands of you have also expressed the desire to help further this content ministry or movement, as some have referred to it. Now is the time. It is time for you all to think not about content you will receive from me, but what you can do to make sure other people discover the content that changed your life and outlook on Scripture. If you contribute, please continue to do so. Great amount of content now depends directly on your continued support. All of these I have begun in some way are crucial to keep my content live and free online for others to discover and pass on. I can no longer do that. I am spent in service to you. So now it is time for you to replicate the blessing you've experienced in the lives of others. I die with the belief that you will, like I did, take the long look of being a blessing to others to help them rediscover their Bible for the first time and to embrace the gospel as believing loyalty. Please be a part of what is now taking shape for the glory of the kingdom. I'll be greatly blessed by you all. Sincerely, Dr. Michael Heiser. So that was tough for me to make and maybe tough for you to watch. Um, before we go any further, I just want to acknowledge the fact of how difficult it is for any of us to lose someone. You and so many others who were very close to Heiser, uh, these feelings can only be magnified. And I just want to let you, Andrina, and everyone else know that we acknowledge the pain and want to be considerate as we navigate through even this documentary. Um, so with that being said, tell us thoughts on that clip uh, Mike's letter and and what you think about the upcoming Heiser documentary. I think it's a it's a good opportunity for people to to actually get to know Mike more as a person, right? I think sometimes people remember Mike more for you know like moments like that where he's he's very uh, very punchy with his description of a theological point, but like I especially love the fact that there was just a very regularity about him, right? That he he was a regular guy who who enjoyed talking about baseball <laughs> shooting the breeze about football mm -hmm. he was a regular dude and he just did his best in service to, to to the to the greater church to the community of god he wanted people to understand who our god is and understand the scriptures in a way that helps reveal that more to us right and so yeah, I, I think like I remember reading that letter when it was finally published. We knew it was coming in the Facebook community, like amongst us admins. Um, we knew that um, the news of eventually what will happen uh, was going to reach out. And so, yeah, it brings back some memories of what that was like reading it for the first time when it came mm -hmm. out, um, helping people process, helping people kind of comprehend that yes, that unfortunately there is the progression of the disease as typically said in, in medical settings, um, it is moving forward, it is continuing, it is not stopping. And so we have to prepare. Um, so I appreciate that you are doing this work. I'm glad that Ruben is also helping and, and just that this is a great way to honor Mike's memory and his legacy. Um, I think I can say at least for myself, but I'm pretty sure the, the the Heiser Foundation and including Drina would also express their appreciation and thanks as well, that this is good. It, it's good to keep the memory of what Mike represented, what he stood for and what he wanted to see in the aftermath of his own passing. That this, this work in the end is not only on his shoulders. It was never only on his shoulders. Um, the scholarship, like he said, it, it's always been there. And it simply needs people to, like I said earlier about that idea of creating that bridge and bringing it over to our modern context of helping people see the connections that we do have even to our past. And, and that that ancient context may not be so different from us as a people. And, and to see that the messaging and really the, the questions that the ancient Israelite or the second temple period person was trying to answer are really pretty much the same questions that we're asking in our day today. Yeah, I love that. And I thank you for being brave enough to pick up the baton uh, from Mike. You know, when you told that story earlier of him, you know, leaning on you 
for some of the podcasts and different things at Awakening as he was getting through treatments. You know, your faithfulness in those moments um, are really important. We're really important to Mike, obviously, but also really important to all of us, uh, Mike. So I, I'm, I'm just, I'm thankful for you. Thank you for your diligent work you are putting in to help keep the legacy and teachings of Heiser alive. I want to remind everyone to listen and watch for you on the DCW podcast and Facebook page. Um, and also remind everyone to consider contributing to what, uh, you know, we talked about with awakening and, and all the different ways that you can get plugged in. If this material has affected you, there are ways for you to contribute and help both by sharing it and, and by donating. Um, so, you know, to all of the organizations, uh, we just, we thank you for what you're doing, Mike. And from all of our community here at Ring Them Bells, we salute you and we thank you for your service to the one true King Jesus. And we are excited to follow you into the continued journey of the Divine Council worldview. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. At the end of the road, the, the, the big payoff, again, for paying attention to the heavenly host is that if we have what I call the Divine Council worldview in our heads, we will come to realize when we get to the book of Revelation and even earlier chapters like Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 2, that human believers, the human family of God, actually forms the reconstituted, made new council of God. When we think about glorification, you know, uh, evangelicals like to use the word glorification, other traditions use the word theosis or exaltation or something like that. Human believers in their final state are made like Jesus, yes, but we become fit for sacred space in the, in the most ultimate sort of way. We, as human beings, created lesser than the Elohim, Psalm 8. In Hebrews has lesser than the angels, lower than the angels. We are actually elevated to that position to occupy that status rank and form a, a newly constituted council for God, council with God, to enjoy creation, and to you know, manage it, do whatever God wants done in the final state. God gets his way with a restored Eden, and we are his glorified family, along with the members of the heavenly host who remain loyal to him. So we have a functional sort of corporate family partnership model going on here. And at the end of days, that's what we are, and that's our status.